G'day, my name's Nick Jones. I'm the cardiology registrar here at Bendigo Health and I've been asked to give a brief talk about valvular heart disease. So obviously valvular heart disease is a very large topic. So I've sort of uh, narrowed it down to the most common two types of valvular lesions and we'll just have a brief run through them. There's a couple of cases and sort of with a really focus on, uh, on practical applications and, and the management of them. So we'll start with the most common uh, valvular lesions, which is aortic stenosis. Um, so the first case is that of an 86 year old gentleman uh, who presents with collapse on a six month history of shortness of breath and chest pain. Um, on examination he had a large ejection systolic murmur consist uh, radiating to the carotids consistent with aortic stenosis and he went on to have an echo performed which showed a poor ejection fraction at 35% and a mean aortic gradient of, uh, of very high at 80%. And you'll see on the, on the right hand side of this, of this screen this is a uh, an echo picture, just a single snapshot taken of the aortic valve and you can see that it's very thickened and very calcified and that's normally what we see in patients presenting with calcific aortic valve disease. Um, and the lower one, you'll see, in the lower picture here you'll see that the valves should normally be nice and thin like this and here they're, they're quite thickened and, and abnormal looking. Um, so uh, he was initially seen in clinic um, and was uh, uh, the process was started for him to have an aortic valve replacement, um, so that process was begun. Unfortunately, as many of these patients happens, that they then present to emergency departments with acute decompensated heart failure. Um, he was transferred to a tertiary centre where he underwent, uh, after attempts at diuresis, he uh, underwent a balloon aortic valvuloplasty or a BAV, which is what we're seeing here on the, in the animation on the right hand side, where we put a catheter into the right groin and thread a wire up across the valve and expand a balloon to try and break up that calcification. That's a good temporary measure and it lasts sort of three to six months, but it is very much a contemporising measure until more uh, permanent, uh, a permanent fix can be had. So this is just the balloon going up now um, and you see it going up the ascending aorta and then we'll cross the valve and then we'll expand. It doesn't actually remove the valve and we find that it does just recalcify and re-stick. So that's the balloon going up there. Um, our particular patient had a good result to the, the BAV. Um, uh, with a reduction in gradient and symptoms and then that allowed us time to work him up more uh, properly for it to have a trans aortic valve implantation or replacement or a TAVI which he had six months later and this is the TAVI part of the procedure now where you can see the valve again going up through the, ascend the abdominal and the ascending and descending aortas and we'll see in a minute that the valve will be, re will be inflated within that uh, old valve and it just pushes the old valve out of the way and, ha and has a good new valve inserted so that will happen in about a couple of seconds hopefully. Um, we reviewed him 12 months later and he had a good response to the TAVI with both reduction in symptoms, gradient as well as echo features of, of aortic stenosis. Um, the, he actually was complicated by the most common complication of the TAVI, the TAVI system or a TAVI and that's requiring a pacemaker. So that's about 10 to 20 percent of patients who have a TAVI require a pacemaker. So the take home messages for aortic stenosis is it's the most common form of valvular heart disease we see affecting about 43% of the patients with valvular heart disease. And we're really looking for those cardinal symptoms of shortness of breath, chest pain and syncope on exertion. So sort of the typical history we get is someone who's rushing to get a bus who just suddenly passes out. And that's really the textbook uh, exertional syncope. The leading etiology continues to be sort of the degenerative or calcification, uh, cal calcification of the aortic valve causing the fusion of those valve leaflets. Um, but we also see the bicuspid aortic valves associated with congenital heart disease patients. The prognosis for patients with severe aortic stenosis that isn't managed is the survival rate's only sort of 15 to 50 percent at five years, so it's got quite a high mortality associated with it. Um, the management options, the, main, the, the first line is, continues to be medical therapy, though I would note that you have to avoid sort of the peripheral dilators in severe aortic stenosis as it will worsen the gradient. So ACE inhibitors and particularly GTN can be problematic in these patients. But the, in terms of the being a mechanical structural problem, it needs a mechanical fix. And that's either the traditional surgical aortic valve repair through open heart surgery, which can be done either as a mechanical or a bi-prosthetic valve, the contemporising balloon valvuloplasty, which we mentioned earlier, or the new TAVI program. And I guess the advantages of the TAVI is patients that were previously not fit to have um, open heart surgery are now a lot more uh, amenable to, f to fix and we've had some really good responses to, to TAVI patients. Just one note is that TAVI or TAVR are exactly the same procedure, it's just dependent on whether you're in the United States or, or um, Europe. 
We'll move on to mitral regurgitation. So that, as I'm sure you're all aware, the mitral valve sits between the um, left atrium as well as uh, the, uh, between the left atrium and the, right and the left ventricle. Um, and it's a much more complex structure than the aortic valve. So the aortic valve is a semi-lunar valve, while the mitral valve has not only the valve, but also the subvalvular structures of the papillary muscles and the chordae. So that makes it much more difficult to, um, to repair and to, and to fix, particularly percutaneously. So a case for this one is a, a 45 year old lady. And this is sort of the textbook uh, or the typical patient that we get with mitral valve disease. So 45 year old lady who's presented with an incidental finding of a murmur, um, had a physical exam that shows the, the typical pan-systolic murmur that often radiates to the back or up into the sternum, depending on which leaflet's involved. Um, and a TTE that showed mild to moderate mitral regurgitation, but it was otherwise largely normal. Um, she was reviewed in our clinic and the decision was made for a 12 month repeat echo to see if there's any progression of the disease um, and, uh, and so she was booked for a 12 month review. However, not infrequently these patients come back to see us earlier than their planned review date um, with worsening shortness of breath and a TTE showed that she'd developed severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, it's really important in mitral regurgitation that we actually understand the etiology um, of the mitral regurgitation as it does affect how we can manage these patients. Um, so she had underwent a transesophageal echo, which is much better at looking at, looking at the mitral valve than the, the transthoracic is, um, which showed a prolapse of the posterior mitral valve leaflets, which was probably the cause of her initial mitral regurgitation, that mild to moderate that we found initially. Um, and then, but it also showed a flail segment, and that's probably due to a rupture of that subvalvular cordae um, that's caused her mild moderate MR to become severe MR. It also shows severe tricuspid regurgitation as well as pulmonary hypertension, which is not an unusual thing to find in someone with such severe MR, as the pressures just back up across the pulmonary capillary bed. And it's actually a marker of, of prognosis to have severe MR and uh, tricuspid regurgitation. It's very much a functional tricuspid regurgitation, so it's caused by the dilatation of that right ventricle, um, which causes the annulus or the ring around the, uh, the valve to spread out so that there's no coarctation of the, of the vessels, of the, of the leaflet, sorry. Um, so this patient underwent a successful mitral valve replacement uh, without complication and she's now doing very well. So my take home messages for mitral regurgitation is the mechanism is really important. For the aortic valve, for the, for the aortic stenotic patients, it's less important what the etiology is because we're just going to replace the valve. Although there is some new uh, valve repairs doing for aortic regurgitation, for aortic stenosis it really doesn't matter what the etiology is. But for mitral, it's very important. So whether it's functional and it's that the, uh, they've just got poor LV function for another reason and that's causing that, di that dilatation of the annulus again, um, or whether there's a flail or a prolapse, so there's a problem with either the valve itself or the subvalvular apparatus, or there can just be a restrictive le leaflet, normally caused by previous ischemic heart disease. Um, the one thing that I wanted to mention about mitral valve disease is that um, a patient can be asymptomatic and still, be, still require surgical repair. And that's normally because the LV size is, uh, sorry, it should be the LV function is decreasing. Um, so if their EF drops with, uh, with mitral regurgitation, it's a sign that their mitral valve disease is progressing. Um, in terms of treatment options, there's, there's lots of treatments and the first line continues to be good heart failure medication. So I think it's important that despite the fact that these patients have valvular heart disease, if their ejection fractions are poor, they still need to be managed as heart failure with reduced ejection fractions. And beta blockers have been shown to, imp to improve, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors and, and spironolactone have all been shown to um, improve their symptoms and improve their mortality. Um, so the treatment options, uh, again it's a mechanical problem and once it gets to that severe level we're really looking at mechanical solutions. There's more and more options on the market and this is an exciting time for mitral valve disease because we're now moving from a very much a traditional mechanical valve, open heart surgery, high relatively risky procedures to uh, the new percutaneous options which is the mitral clip where we can go through the vein of the leg and put a small clip to narrow the aperture or the, the opening of the mitral valve to decrease that, that the amount of mitral regurgitation. Um, the other surgical option is a mitral valve repair and that's rather than giving putting an entire new valve in, we put an annular plasty ring, which is just a plastic ring that holds the mitral valve leaflets together. The advantage of that is the patient doesn't need to be on lifelong anticoagulation, while with a, obviously with a mechanical mitral valve, that's a high risk uh, location with a high risk valve for, um, uh, for valve thrombosis, so they need to be on lifelong anticoagulation. Uh, the new thing that's just coming along now, and it's very much still in the trial process, is the percutaneous mitral valves. 
And as I said before, the mitral valve is a very complex structure, so it's taken a while to really develop an, an ideal situation, an ideal valve or an ideal product in order to reduce your mitral regurgitation. Oh, sorry, for, in order to do a mitral valve repair. So I just wanted to finish off with some random thoughts and a bit of a conclusion. And it's the importance of symptoms in these patients. So really the key of indication that this patient might need surgery is worsening of their symptoms. So whether it's aortic stenosis or, or mitral regurgitation or really any of the other um, diseases, symptoms are key. So if a patient presents who we're seeing or who you're monitoring for your valvular heart disease who get worsening symptoms, that's a sign that something's changed and that's probably a good indication that they need to be referred to a cardiologist to discuss whether to firstly work out whether something needs to be done um, and to work out the urgency of it. Uh, so our second case demonstrated that nicely in that we expected her to be stable for a number of years. These are very slowly developing lesions generally, but if something changes, that's something that we all want to know about. Um, uh, we're also seeing more and more patients that are suitable for intervention. So whether that's percutaneous intervention or surgical intervention with mitral valve repairs, these procedures are becoming safer and safer and can be done on higher risk patients with really good outcomes. So it's important that just because we, uh, that we educate everybody, the GPs as well as other physicians, that just because someone's old and a bit frailer, it doesn't exclude them from having um, valvular, uh, valvular procedures, particularly the TAVIs or the, mit or the percutaneous mitral clip procedures. Um, I just, often we get asked how often do we need to monitor these patients and as I said, it, it's, a lot of it's going to be guided by what symptoms the patient have particularly someone who presents with mild or moderate mitral regurgitation or mild or moderate aortic stenosis. These are very much lesions that develop over years and years. And it's not unreasonable for someone with mild aortic stenosis who have had a couple of echoes on, on over a couple of years, who isn't particularly progressing particularly quickly, um, it's not unreasonable to do second yearly, third yearly or even five yearly echoes on these patients just to monitor how they're going. Of course, if they develop symptoms in that time, that obviously changes how often you follow them up. Um, the other question is when we refer these when to refer these patients to a cardiologist. So we very rarely do anything for patients who um, have moderate diseases, particularly if they're asymptomatic. Um, a wait and watch approach is perfectly reasonable, and particularly in the country where patients are travelling large distances to see us, it's not unreasonable to follow these patients up in the community with a shared care approach that we can see them every couple of years, or we can see them uh, as you think we need to see them. Um, but they can have echoes in their local towns uh, and be monitored by yourselves. And if things change or if you need us, then we're always there to help you out. And I think the most important thing to note is that if you're worried about a patient or if the echo findings don't match what you're seeing clinically, then there are conditions that the echo findings don't match the, the physical, don't match the symptoms that the patient has. And that's where you need to give us a call. And we're always contactable. So if you have any questions about any of these issues, please just give us a call. So thank you very much for your time.